Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. This week, we are in Parsha Re'e. Yahweh is telling the people of Israel through Moshe that when you go into the land, I want you to do something. See, we, we learned some things here. We've been, uh, over the past couple of weeks, talking about the importance of hearing his voice. The importance of when Yahweh speaks, we need to hear. And then we need to do what he has instructed us. See, to hear Shema, it's not just to hear something, it's to hear with the intent of acting on what you have heard, also known as obedience. So this is what Yahweh is telling us. So it is important for us to walk in the life of blessing that he has for us just by, just by listening to his voice. So if we listen to him, there is blessing there for that. And he wants us to remember that as we live our life day to day. And that's what he was telling Israel. He says, when you go into the land, I'm bringing you into the land, but when you go into the land, there's something I want you to do. And uh, this was not just the responsibility of one person. We know Yehoshua was leading the people into the land. Moshe couldn't, right? So uh, Yehoshua led them into the land, and it wasn't Yehoshua's conquest. This was the people of Israel all going in, right? But even in that, uh, it was a group effort. But yet, each individual among the people of Israel had to determine within themselves they're going to do this. See, what if it was a group effort and everybody needs to do it and the people individually decided, let somebody else do it, I'll, I'll cheer them on. It wouldn't get done. And so Yahweh is saying here in this portion, he says, a see, which also means to experience, so to see and experience something, it's not just having sight with our eyes, he wants us to experience the word, which means when we're living life and going through things, he wants us to apply what he has taught us. Okay, so this is what uh, uh, Yahweh is, is telling the people here. You go into the land, there's something I want you to do. And we're going to start off by addressing that. All right, so Deuteronomy 11 verse 26 says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Okay, Re is the word that's given there, Re, and uh, it means to appear or to discern or to experience something. Re is also the the, um, the, name, the the word for a shepherd. So all of these are working together, all right? So what is he setting before the people? What is he wanting them to see? What is he wanting them to experience? A blessing and the curse. And because Yahweh is setting before us these things, see, he's, he's, he's telling us, this is blessing, this is curse. And then he talks about our obedience to him and we get that life of blessing. But if we turn away from him, then there's this life of curse that comes in, which we see again later on, uh, later on in this book of Deuteronomy. This is kind of visited again. But Yahweh is saying, for this purpose today, I'm setting before you a blessing and a curse. And then with this information, I want you to do something as individuals and as a collective. Because this one sentence, see, I'm setting before you today the blessing and the curse. The C, Re'e, is written in a singular form. So he's saying, you as individuals, I am setting before each and every one of you. And this setting before you is lifnechem, which is plural. So for you as an individual, I am setting before all of you. In other words, we cannot forget that while, yes, Yahweh is wanting this personal relationship with us, he is calling us to be a part of a people, part of his kingdom that he's called out that we're supposed to walk in, okay? When we come into covenant, we receive covenant with Yahweh as an individual. We make that decision if we are going to repent of our ways, to come to follow him, to join in covenant with him. But when we do that, we're not just joining in covenant with Yahweh, we're joining in covenant with his people. We're, we're, we are entering covenant as individuals, but we are also in covenant collective as a whole. See? And so this is, uh, this is telling us that while I enter into covenant with Yahweh, I have responsibilities to the collective, to the whole, to help build his kingdom. And that's why Yeshua said the most important thing is, what? Right, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, all your mind, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's why he, he said these two things together, back to back, because they are related, right? Okay, um, so because we're given the word, he, he said, this is what I'm telling you, I'm showing you a, a blessing and a curse, because we are given the word, he wants us 
to set it in place where we dwell. And what I mean by this is day by day, we are to keep the word in the forefront of our minds so that we can make right decisions, so that we can make right choices, so that we can do things that honor and glorify him, right? And so sometimes that takes some extra thought. If we're not used to making these kind of decisions, making these kind of choices, we might have to stop and think about it for a bit. But after a while, these, de these decisions and these choices just become second nature. See, and it's because of repetition, because you are doing them, because you are walking with him, because of these things. But from time to time, we need to revisit uh, what Yahweh desires for us. We forget things. And, uh, and not to mention, you know, we may see things we may have never seen before, right? So this is what Yahweh is telling them. I am setting before you today blessing and curse. With this information, when you go into the land, I want you to set before you the blessing and curse. But I want you to do it, not just within you, but I want you to do it in a very physical way that's going to stand as a reminder, not just for you, but for generations to come. And that's what happens. As we go to Deuteronomy 11, 29 and 30, it says, yet when Yahweh your God brings you into the land and you enter and take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ava. And are they not beyond the Yardin, west of the road? Okay, so again, uh, it says uh, beyond the, uh, uh, beside the Oak of Moray. And this is an interesting phrase, beside the Oak of Moray, uh, Elon Moray. This is where Yahweh spoke to Avram and said, see this land? I'm going to give you this land to you and your descendants, right? And so uh, if you stand at Elon Moray, you have a very beautiful view of Shechem and Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And so this is where Israel was supposed to be. So this was a reminder to them that, it, that when they go into the land, this is part of the covenant that they have with Yahweh for Israel through Avraham, Isaac, Yaakov. The covenant God, God gave to Abraham, he's saying, was set in place, and I want you to go in and set this in place as a reminder for you of the covenants that I have called you into. Okay, so what's, what's fascinating and interesting about uh, Gerizim and Ava? All right. They're both in the Northern Territory. They're both in the territory of Ephraim. They both share the same soil. They're not that far from each other. It's not like way, way, way over there is this other mountain. No, they're really not far from each other. Okay, they, so which means they have the same air, they have the same pollen, but yet they are, they are very different. Mount Gerizim, it's, uh, it's, it's green and things grow there. There's wells there and there's life there. And people live there and uh, there's vineyards there. there. All this is there. Mount Aval, it's bare, it's rocky, it's dusty, it's 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 you know it, it's barren. It's it's not that not that great to live there. And Shechem is right in between them. Shechem is the place of the shoulders, right? A valley of decision, if you will. You can kind of phrase it that way. It is a place of the shoulders where you're turning to see to look around you. You know the shoulders and the neck, and you turn which way you're you're going to look. So this is what we're talking about. He says to set before you. Life, life and death, blessing and cursing, which we see later on in Deuteronomy where it's phrased that way. But if you look at Mount Gerizim, literally as they proclaim the blessings of the covenant toward Mount Gerizim, you see it's blessed. And then if you look towards Aval, you see that this is the result of, of what curses can do. So again, this is what Yahweh is telling us to constantly set before you what I have asked you to walk in. So the question comes to, can we live where we can see the blessing, but not walk in the blessing? Think about that for a second. Can we just camp out at Shechem and not do anything? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, we have the choices to make and what we're going to choose to do. And we see an example of this in Yeshua. So we have a story that ties in with this whole thing. In John chapter 4, verses 3 through 24, so let's kind of go in and kind of go through that really quick. So Yeshua, he left Judea and he went back to the Galilee and he passed through Samaria, Shomron, okay, Samaria. Uh, so he comes to a Samaritan town called Shechem. We just talked about that, right? So he's in Shechem, right? So near the plot of land that Yaakov gave to his son, Yosef. Now Jacob's sons were there. So, or Jacob's well was there. And so Yeshua exhausted from the journey was sitting by the well and it was midday. Many of you know this story, right? So where are they at? They're in Shomron, Samaria, at Shechem, 
Whereas uh, you have the great view of Mount Gerizim and Mount Aval right there in the Northern Territory of Ephraim, right? So a little bit of what's going on here. Let's talk about uh, the Shomron and let's talk about Shechem. The capital of Israel originally was Shechem before uh, it ultimately became Yerushalayim, okay? Shechem was a city of refuge. Also, Yosef's bones were buried at Shechem. And Shechem was the place where the covenant was put in place when Israel crossed over the Jordan, which we, which we see he's telling them here in Deuteronomy 11 to do so. But when you read in Joshua, when they cross into the land, they actually do this. In Joshua chapter uh, uh, 24, Joshua assembled all the tribes together and challenged them to repent of idolatry and follow Yahweh at, from this place. Okay, so all of this, why gathering to this place? Because it's the reminder of setting before you blessing and cursing, and you have to choose what you're going to do, right? Okay, um, so, after, so after Shechem, uh, later the capital of the northern kingdom was Shomron, and the northern kingdom was overthrown in 722 BC by the Assyrians. All this is going to make sense here in just a minute, okay? So a lot of the Hebrew people that were there were exiled, but it was be also believed that many intermarried. Let's, let, here's what's going to happen. If they um, didn't exile everybody and there are people that are remaining there, they're going to marry, right? And so if you go to 2 Kings 17, it says that the Assyrians brought people from five other countries to dwell there. Because what they did when the Assyrians, uh, they conquered, they didn't just exile everybody or they didn't just come in and just rule over everybody. They came in and then they brought people from other countries to cause them to intermingle. Okay. So as a result of this, uh, the people of Samaria were considered to be mixed ethnic, uh, ethnically and religiously. So in other words, they were classified by, uh, by the people of, of Israel as pagan because they were part of these uh, uh, where the Assyrians had brought in from five other countries and introducing their own gods from their own places, their own idolatry. And then they would uh, mingle with them and they would marry with them. And so they would become defiled, right? Okay. So we'll go in and take, let's take a quick look at this. Second Kings 17, 24 to 29. So the king of Assyria brought the people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamat, and Sepharvaim, and he placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the men of Israel. So they possessed Samaria and settled in its cities. And when they first began dwelling there, they did not fear Adonai. See that? So they, they didn't fear Yahweh. So Adonai sent lions among them, which killed some of them. It got their attention. Then they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations that you deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria do not know the requirement of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions among them, and behold, they are killing them because they don't know the requirement of the God of the land. <laughs> That's kind of an understatement, right? Okay, verse 27. So then the king of Assyria command, commanded, saying, So send there one of the Kohanim whom you have exiled from there, and let them go and live there and teach the requirement of the God of the land. You would think that's a good thing, right? So we don't know what their God says, how they're supposed to live in the land, and people are dying because of it, because they're not living like they're supposed to in the land. And uh, they're, they're having idolatry here where there's not supposed to be any. We don't, know, we don't know what's going on. So he says, tell you what, you exiled the Kohanim. You exiled these people. Go get one of the Kohen whom you exiled. Bring him in so that he can teach people what their God says. Sounds like a great idea, right? But what's the result? Verse 28. So one of the Kohanim that had been deported from Samaria came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear Adonai. However, every nation kept making its own gods. And then put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made in every nation, their cities where they had settled. So what was going on is they, they syncretism. They were mixing the holy and the profane. They were, okay, this is how you're supposed to worship their God, the God of Israel, but we're going to continue to worship our own gods. So it was just another God that they had among them. So again, they had instruction. They didn't receive it and walk in it. And so there's, there's a history that's going on there. So this was kind of a, a, a quick uh, backstory of, of what was going on with Samaria. So now Yeshua's here and he's in Shomron, in the Samaria, and uh, he's at the well, and this woman comes to draw water, and they have this conversation. And Yeshua says, give me a drink. And his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And so he says, you know, can you give me a drink? And the woman says, how is it that you, a Jew, Ask me a Samaritan woman for a drink because Jewish people don't deal with Samaritans. Why? Because of what we had just gone through, what, what we just explained. 
All right. They were considered pagan. Okay. Verse 10. So Yeshua replied, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman tells him, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. So how do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and he drank out of it himself with his sons and his cattle. Verse 13. So Yeshua says, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will be a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I won't thirst anymore. So, ne so neither come or neither come here to draw anymore. Like, hey, man, that would save me a lot of time, right? If I have this water that's going to be a constant supply of water, I'm never going to have to draw water again. Great. So what happens next? <laughs> What's going on here? Right? Okay. So Yeshua is going and, and, and he answers to her um, about going and getting her husband. Right? And what does she say? So the woman says, I have no husband. Yeshua said, you've well said you have no husband. If you have five husbands and he whom you are with is not your husband that you have said truly. So Wow. So he says, truly, you know, so you don't have a husband. You've, you've had five. You've had five. So this could have literally been, yeah, she's had five husbands, but this could also have a second meaning, right? Something a little more deeper, something that's going further, possibly alluding to the five idols that were brought by the Assyrians, right? Our, and Because scripture says our husband is Yahweh. Isaiah 54, 5, your husband is your maker. Yahweh Tzavod is his name. And Hoshea 2, 16 says on that day, you will call me Ishi, my husband, right? So again, Yahweh is our husband. And so we are to forsake all other idols. Because in Hoshea 2, 16, it says you will no longer call me Baali, which means my master. Um, but Baal is also the word given for the idols, right? Okay, it's just a term of, uh, like a term of authority, Baal, it's, it's, it's master, and that's how that translates. And that's what he says, you're not going to consider me just another, just another God. You're not just going to consider me just another master. You will be, you know, I will be your husband, and we'll have that relationship. So that's what we're talking about, all right? Because don't forget about that. We saw in 2 Kings 17, okay, you go to verses 30 to 34. It says, so the people of Babylon made Sukkot Benoth, the people of Kuth and Nergal and the people of Hamath and Ashima, the Avites, Nivad and Tartek and the Sephardites, they burned their children in the fire to Adrimelech and uh, Animelech, the gods of Sepharvaim. So they feared Adonai, while they also appointed for themselves from among themselves priests of the shrines who officiated for them in the shrines of the high places. Verse 33, they continued to fear Adonai, but worshiped their own gods after the custom of the nations from which they had been deported. So up to this day, they follow their former customs, nor do they fear Adonai or follow the statutes, the ordinances or the Torah or the mitzvah that Adonai commanded for the children of Jacob, whom he had renamed Israel. So again, when Yeshua is saying, um, so who do, you, who, who do you serve, right? He could say, so, so let me talk to your husband, do that. But on the other hand, he could be pointing out spiritually, so who do you serve? Who do you really serve? You know, are you, are you serving idols or are you serving the one true God, Right. And the woman says, it's funny because, you know, here, you know, now she's confronted with some truth, right? So the woman says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Really? You're kidding, right? <laughs> well, that, that's a good start, right? So here he is. It says, I, I, she says, I, I perceive you're a prophet. And does she start to, uh, you know, start to repent? Does she go get her husband? Does she, you know, talk about, so how do I, how do I serve the one true God? I mean, any of this stuff, right? Not really. The first question that she has is uh, is to try to bring some validity to their uh, their belief, their doctrine. And it's like, are, do we do the same thing when we come to Yahweh? Do we say you are the one true God, but I want you to to solidify my beliefs, right? Or do we do that? Or are we willing to change when we come to him? Right? When we serve him, we serve him completely. Are we willing to change and do that? So continuing John chapter 4, verse 19. So the woman says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. And then immediately goes into, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. So what's the real question that's going on here? The question is, so who's right? Us or them? We worship this way. 
they worship that way. Are you going to validate my opinions or do I keep looking for a different prophet? It kind of has that little bit of an undertone there, right? And what does Yeshua say to her? Yeshua says, woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither this mountain nor at Yerushalayim worship the Father. You worship what you know not. We worship what we, what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. I want to bring some relevance here. Uh, he's, he's not saying that Jerusalem doesn't matter. He's not saying Mount Gerizim, Mount Evil doesn't matter. What he's saying is you've missed the point. The point of all this is worship the Father. To worship Yahweh. See, it's, it's not about um, where. It's about how. <laughs> it wasn't about you have to worship at this mountain. Do you worship him wherever you go? See, do you set before you the covenant? Do you set before you the promises that he has given you and, and learn to walk in those? Worship the Father. Verse 23, so the hour comes and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So, he says uh, the truth, okay, so in order to worship him in spirit, you don't deny the truth. In order to have the truth, you can't do away with the spirit of it either. Let's put this in a different context. People talk about the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law, right? You can't know the spirit of the law without knowing the letter of the law. Because you can't understand the motive behind it if you don't know what it says. <laughs> so again, we have this picture of we need to worship in spirit and truth. We need to learn the truth so we can learn the heart behind it, to worship in the spirit behind it. Yeshua brought focus to worship the Father. It, and not just here on this mountain. This, it's, it's not like you're supposed to worship God on Mount Gerizim. You are to be reminded of the covenant at Mount Gerizim. See that? There's a difference. And yeah, you, you, there's nothing wrong with worshiping him. There's nothing wrong with, with doing that really wherever you are, which we should. But um, it's about him. It's not about it, it, Mount Gerizim, Mount Aval, if you, if, if you will, you can let me use this, this analogy. They're signs. They're signs to point the way as you leave this place and go on and keep walking, you are to be mindful of where the signs point. Gerizim pointed to blessing if you choose to do so. Aval pointed to curse if you choose to walk that way. Now you make the choice and you keep going. You don't camp out at the sign. The sign was to point you to keep going. See? And even Yeshua uh, spoke about the truth that we need to be set apart by the truth. Remember when he in John chapter 17, when he prayed for his disciples, he said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. And he said, your word is truth. So we learn the word is truth. We need to walk in truth, but we also need to walk in spirit and truth. And he showed us that when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, you're my and your neighbors yourself. This is learning the spirit of the truth as we learn to walk in the truth. And a point of all this is learning to walk and bring in a life together, which we go on continuing. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16 and 17 talks about the gathering together of the people of Israel to worship. And he says, three times a year, all your males are to appear before Adonai your God in the place he chooses, the Feast of Matzot, the Feast of Shavuot, and the Feast of Sukkot. And none shall, shall appear before Adonai empty-handed, the gift of each man's hand, according to the blessing Adonai your God has given you. So when people are gathered together, is it just for a party? No, they gather together for worship and to hear the word, especially during the time of Sukkot. Because remember, during the time of Sukkot, every seventh year, the, all, the, all the Torah was read to all the people who were gathered there for Sukkot. So when all the people are gathered together, the Torah will go forth from Zion. Much like when all gathered together, like Israel gathered at Horeb, at Sinai, the word of Yahweh went forward. When Yahweh's people gather together, the word of Yahweh should go forward where we can all hear it, we can all learn the heart of Yahweh, and we can learn to walk in a place of unity coming together. Not my own pet doctrine, not my own, uh, my own thing that I really want to focus on right now. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, please study, learn all you can. But don't put that above 
everything else. You know, we can get stuck in the, okay, so you're getting caught in this minutia of thing, forgetting the weight of your matters, right? We need to learn to love one another. We need to learn to walk that way. And uh, that means sometimes we need to change our focus and, and, and to do that. Okay, uh, which we see in Deuteronomy 31, verses 10 to 13. It says, Moshe commanded saying, at the end of every seven years, in the set time of year, the canceling debts during the Feast of Sukkot, when all Israel comes to appear before Adonai, your God, in the place he chooses, you are to read this Torah before them in their hearing. So gather the people, the men, the women, the little ones, and the outsider within your town gate, so they may hear, and they may learn, and they will fear Adonai, your God, and take care to do all the words of this Torah. So their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear Adonai, your God, all the days you live in the land that you are about to cross over the Jordan to possess. See? So when we all gather together, it is the word that needs to go forward, and we need to worship him together. We gather to Yahweh to worship him and to worship him alone. And we are given instruction to, uh, to walk in his ways. That's what he was telling us at Mount Gerizim and Mount Abel and at Shechem. He was telling us, this is the path of blessing that I have for you, walk in that. And if someone tries to lead you away, then that's the result. The curse is the result of that, which going to Deuteronomy 13, one through five says, whatever I command you, you must take care to do. You're not to add to it or take away from it. And then he kind of throws a scenario in there. So suppose a prophet or a dreamer of dreams rises up among you and gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or wonder that he spoke to you comes true while saying, let's follow other gods that you have not known and let's serve them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for I don't know your God is testing you to find out whether you love, I don't know your God with all your heart and all your soul. I don't know your God, you will follow and him you will fear. His mitzvot you will keep to his voice. You will listen and you to him you will serve and to him you will cling. See that? So what he's telling us to do is how do we learn to have this path of uh, blessing? Just walk with him, learn to, learn to do that, and then the rest will come as, you, as we are following him. Don't be led astray. You know, don't lose sight just by getting caught up at the sign. You know, don't lose sight of this. Uh, don't, or even people who are just very clever, right? Some, some real slick people who can just kind of sell you anything, right? Don't get caught up in all that. Stay focused. Shechem is the reminder this is the path you choose. And if someone tries to come and tries to steer you over to the other mountain, well, look where that leads you, right? Be careful who you allow to speak into your life. Just because someone is talented doesn't mean, you know, just because they, they have the ability to do something well doesn't mean that God has, has uh, anointed them to do that in, in a place in your life. Just because someone has talent doesn't mean they're godly either. There's a lot of people who are very talented, really don't care what Yahweh has to say. Okay, so just because just because someone's talented doesn't mean that God has, has they have this relationship with Yahweh. What about uh, uh, someone who's a very charismatic type of person? You know, they're they're very compelling. They're, they're, they just draw people to themselves. Very charming, right? They can inspire other people. But again, that doesn't mean they have a great relationship with Yahweh. It means that they can be a great motivator. They, and you're like, man, I really like that guy. I like how he makes me feel, right? But it doesn't mean that he has your best interests at heart. It doesn't mean that he's desiring what Yahweh desires for you. Again, be careful. And then anointing is what Yahweh has called for. Remember when the priests were set in the service, he anointed them for service. And to anoint someone, it means they were chosen. Okay? They were, they were, they were set apart and chosen for their purpose. And so Yahweh has chosen his people to be set apart, to live for him, to be in a place to choose blessing and to set those choices before others. You can look and you can see the result of blessing and curse. And when we do that, you know, do we say, okay, here I am, I'm living in Shechem. Uh, I could be like this lady that met Yeshua at the well and saying, I'm not living a very blessed life but there's the blessing right there. I just don't understand. Okay. Again, are you walking in his ways? Are you doing the things that he is saying? Because that's what produces the blessing to hear his voice, walk with him. Otherwise known as obedience with the right heart. See with the heart to walk with him, with the heart to do what he says, that's going to change your life. If we're resentful for the things Yahweh has given us, he's not going to bless us for resenting him. So he's asked us to love him. 
and to walk with him and trust him in the paths that he has for us. And so that's what we're learning here. That's how we learn to worship in spirit and in truth. Submit to Yahweh, hear his voice, and learn to do day by day. All right? So we, we have, see what the word says, what the truth is, but then we catch the spirit in there as well. To love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. All right. That's all I got for you today, guys. Um, it's a lot in there. I hope it's a blessing to you. I hope it challenges you a little bit and encourages you. Uh, so if it uh, has blessed you, then please share it. Guys, in whatever avenue you watch or you listen, uh, these videos or podcasts, whatever, um, share them. Help get it out there. So that way, if it's blessed you, it's going to bless somebody else too, right? So help us to do that. And if this has been a blessing to you, then please consider making a donation to help us to continue to put these out there. We can only do that because you make it possible. All right. So with that, guys, be blessed, be a blessing, and shalom.